Hello, welcome to F8. I'm Ari Grant. I'm an engineering manager on iOS, and I'm here to talk to you about our iOS app, uh, our main one. And so I'm going to give you a quick introduction, and then we'll have two other talks following this. So basically, um, we've been working on the iOS app, the native one, for a few years now. And I'm going to talk to you about two big projects that we've worked on over as we've evolved it to build better infrastructure for building our app. So first, I'm going to talk to you about our data model layer and what we've done to make our app better and easier for developers inside Facebook to develop. Then we're going to talk to you about how we took similar patterns that we used to evolve our model layer to do the same with our view in a project called Components. But before we do that, I want to set the stage and kind of tell you how we got where we are today. So a few years ago, we are shipping our app, and it was all HTML-based. It was a bunch of web views inside of a native container. And we decided to move onto the native abstractions that are built into iOS to build our app. And so three years ago, we released an app that was native. But really, it was just native newsfeed, and a few other small parts were native. And so with this came our first native abstractions that we used to build products in our app. Then, over the next year, we evolved the app to make more of it native. And with this, the abstractions we were using to build our features continued to grow. And then, finally, we reached a point where it was fair to say our app was all native, at which point the abstractions we had been building began to fall over. They had kind of reached the end of their own runway. And when I say they began to fall over, this is what I'm referring to. Our app just had spinners. It was slow, you'd be waiting, there were subtle bugs all over the place. And really what was happening was we were suffering subtlety at scale. When you build products, when you build APIs, there's always strange edge cases, little bugs you catch here and there. As our app grew faster and faster and faster, and we had many people using the app, all of these cases were hit more and more often. Our APIs were stressed more and more and more in different parts of the app. And so all of these subtle cases you usually catch here and there, we were seeing daily. And so in our model layer, we were having threading problems, data races, the consistency issues. There were latency problems where you'd be waiting a long time for data. Sometimes there'd be latency for a spinner to start spinning. So maybe you needed a spinner for the spinner. And ultimately, it was just a lot of state tracking. And subtle bugs were everywhere. And so the problem was we had a lot of state, and it was mutable. And so we fixed this by making less state and making everything immutable with a project we called Mem Models, which you're going to hear a bunch about. And the way we actually deployed Mem Models through the app was the same way we moved the app from web to native in the same pattern. We started off adopting it in Newsfeed, then moving it to the rest of the app, and finally a very long tail. But if only at that point we were done and everything was awesome. But it wasn't. We still had a lot of weird, tricky, subtle bugs, like this one, where the UFI, the like button here, was cut off. And this was because the items in the story had been positioned at a different size of the total story than what ended up on screen. And we had issues like this all over. And so we had a lot of similar problems in our view layer as we did in our model. We had recycling bugs when we reused views. We had threading problems because we did text and image layout on a background thread. There were consistency issues, as you just saw in the previous slide. And as the number of stories and feed grew and grew and grew, we had many more new types of permutations of our layout, which meant subtlety all over the place. And so the issue was lots of state and mutability. And so we fixed this by reducing the amount of state and making everything immutable in a project we called Components. No, these are not going to be the exact same two talks with the words replaced, model, and view. But so then we adopted these in the same way as you've seen before. But this time, we at least got a head start, starting to move feed to components while the mem models project was underway. And so you can imagine like waves rippling out through our code base as we adopted these projects, starting from feed. And we want to continue this. Hopefully, soon we can be here next time telling you the next layers and abstractions we've built. As inside of Facebook, we're unifying how we render lists of data. Our app actually has a lot of those and how we paginate data from the server, or from disk, or stream to or from disk. And ultimately, we approach all these projects with a single, simple mindset. If it works for Newsfeed, it's going to work everywhere else. Newsfeed is a really, really intricate product that has a lot of different 
behaviors around text and layout and pagination and disk and permutation of all the different story types. And so we always look at this and say, can we build abstractions that work for feed? And so today we're going to take you through two large projects we worked on and making feed an awesome and fun place to, development, to develop in. And the two projects, as I said, are mem models for our data layer and components for our view layer. And with that, I want to kick it off to Slobodan, who's going to talk about mem models and making our data layer awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Slobodan Predlots. I work as a software engineer in Facebook, New York. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here and have the opportunity to tell you about the data model layer in our main application on iOS. As Ari mentioned, we started three years ago with HTML-based app, but we weren't happy with state of affairs then. Our app didn't have the same look and feel as other applications, and the performance of that application was not where we wanted it to be. It was pretty obvious to us that if we want to achieve these things, we would need to write some native code. And so we did. The first product we wrote in native was Newsfeed. And native feed ran two times faster as HTML version. Results were great. We were happy. We were throwing high fives and thinking it's now just a matter of typing the code for other products, and the performance of our app will go through the roof. However, things didn't work that way. We noticed a disturbing trend. Every time we converted another product to native, it was feed that was getting slower, although no one made any relevant changes to feed module. Usually, that suggests that something in the app is not scaling well. And after short investigation, we realized it was our data layer. I used this term data layer a couple of times already, so let me tell you what do we mean by that in Facebook on iOS. By data layer, we mean that uh, it's a software that should provide easy and efficient access to data graph. When I say easy, I think that it should hide infrastructure complexities like networking, threading, storage from product developers. And when I say efficient, I mean two things. First, it should run fast. And second, it should use our server efficiently. What does that mean? Well, let's say that you were in one view and you wanted to fetch a name of a person. You go to server, you get the result. Now, after 10 minutes, when you're in another view, you might have the same need. Should you go to server? Probably not, because chances are you're going to get the same result. People don't change their names so often. It would be very useful if you have some local cache on the device where you can retrieve that data and save the round trip to server. That local cache can serve additional purpose. If we are in a poor connectivity areas, our app can look better. Instead of letting people stare at a blank screen or a spinner, we can show them some content that they may not have read yet. Now when we know what data model should provide, let's look at some issues that we had with our first solution. It turns out that very significant decision that we made early on was to use core data. That is Apple's object graph and persistence framework, and it pretty much hides database details and lets developers deal with objects. That's a pretty nice abstraction. And early on, we performed some benchmarks uh, to see uh, if abstraction penalty will be too high. We concluded that it would not. However, what happened is that our application grew to have many types, because our data graph is type rich, and on the client, we wanted to have type safety. We wanted all the help from compiler that we can get. What that meant is that first time when we launched the application after install or upgrade, core data has to initialize persistence for the model that has a lot of entities and relationships. And for each entity, it will create a database table in SQLite database. For each relationship, it would create a database index. This was taking a lot of time. We wanted to avoid that time, 
So we came up with some tricks like during the build time, we would create an empty database and then we would ship it in the bundle. This, uh, this saved a lot of time from the first startup. But even after the first uh, launch, the subsequent launches had problem as well. Because even though the database exists, initialization of persistence still takes uh, some time that is proportional to number of entities that you have in your object model. OK, so start was not great, and that's arguably a pretty important time for your application. What happened during runtime? We had problems there as well. Core Data uses NS Managed Object ID to uniquely identify object. But for us, that ID is not so useful because to our servers, it is meaningless. We have keys that are identifying objects in our data graph. So we came up with some uh, layers on top of it where we would map one key to another in order to improve performance. We used key value observing protocol. Uh, which is pretty much a protocol that lets you uh, observe changes on the properties on an object, and you can attach code to be executed. And uh, we ended up having a lot of chains of changes. So when you looked at the controller code, it was really hard to know where did the data came from. For example, someone could run uh, the code because one property changed and then change another property, and then the context for uh, core data objects would get merged, and we wouldn't know how is the data flowing through the system. The third thing that was hitting us in terms of performance was the mechanism that core data uses called faulting. When you're dealing with graph, uh, you cannot load everything starting from that node, because if your graph is huge or connected, you might be hitting your memory limits. Faulting is a mechanism that uh, is pretty reasonable for a generic object graph solution, where you load only uh, certain properties from your node and indication that there is more. So for example, if someone uh, wants to access the data that is not already loaded, the system would fault and go to disk and fetch it. This is very good for memory footprint, but may not be that great for performance, because at the moment where you want to show that on the screen, you might be competing with other things that are going on in your program and trying to use uh, the disk or core data. Core data offers a mechanism called prefetch, which you can use to avoid this. So for example, you can say, whenever I'm loading a comment, load the details about author as well, because I know I will need it soon. But that puts burden on our de product developers, because now they think, need to think, what do I need to prefetch? What do I don't need to prefetch? And we didn't like that. A year ago, my son was three years old, and we got feedback from nursery that he's not that good at sharing. My wife was concerned, and she blamed it on my selfishness. But in line with modern parenting practices, I just told her that our child is gifted for concurrent programming. And if you ever wrote uh, concurrent programs and multi-threaded applications, you know that it's a pretty good idea to minimize the sharing of mutable data. If you do that, you have to provide some synchronization primitives, like locks, mutexes. And I mean, if you don't, you might think that your application is lockless, but others would say it's buggy. <laughs> so you have to do it. And when you do that, you have to worry about contention if the data or resources that you're protecting are popular. You have to worry about deadlocks. There is too much to worry about. Let's see some mistakes that we made in our API design. So if you look at this API, you may guess by the name of arguments that it is supposed to return a collection of objects representing people given the IDs in a given uh, core data context. Now, is there something wrong? It might be debatable, but in, I think that what's wrong is that this API is synchronous, and it can be potentially uh, taking a lot of time. So what this class was doing, it was going to disk, unless the object was already in the memory. And if it didn't find data of, you know, on the disk, it would reach to network. And everything can happen in the main context. That's pretty bad. It's convenient, yet if you call it, your application will freeze. 
would be much better to make this asynchronous and then uh, run the infrastructure on your own threads and queues and then just deliver callback once you have it. One aspect of the first system was not immediately apparent to us because it, originally we just wanted to have a solid native app. But uh, as the time went on, we spoke to our colleagues from Android team, and we realized that very often we are solving the same set of problems. It would be nice to solve them once. We can then stand the set of tools that is available to our platforms because some tools are only available on one of them. We can have a bigger, better test group. And last but not least, when you write cross-platform code, sometimes you are forced to write a better code, to write more reusable and more modular code. If we wrote our code in C++, we could easily share. If we stick with core data, it would be pretty hard because there's no core data on Android. This is a classic dilemma of should I write my own solution or should I pick something that is generic and I don't have access to the source? Well, more code, more problems, but there are upsides if you write your own solution. If you need to fine-tune performance, you can do it. You can cater towards specific app versus write something that should work for a typical app out there. You can debug hard problems. So there are benefits as well. OK, so knowing all of this, what can we do instead? Well, I think you're all tacky, so you can guess based on the title of this talk that we can do MEM models. So instead of one central repo, we can have pair product storages. So we can share less in the central repo while products can store product-specific data in their own storages. This will allow us to assign quotas to each product and have fair distribution of available storage. So one product could not eat all the space and kick the others out. We still want to share something. And let me tell you uh, one example that would illustrate what is it that we want to share. If in your news feed you see a story with an interesting photograph and you notice that the number of likes is nine and you tap on the photo, you open the photo view controller. Photo view controller is specialized for photos and it might fetch more details. Among those details is a fresh number of likes. And when you navigate back to original screen, we would like to have the number of likes consistent. So that is something that we would like to share. On the other hand, if you had a product-specific data, you don't need to share that or something that doesn't change so often, like name that I mentioned earlier. Perhaps the part of the new system that I'd like best is that our MEM models are immutable. Why is this so good? Well, now sharing is trivial. Now, every child can write concurrent programs now, even the well-behaving kids, right? And you can dispatch now objects easily to queues, to threads. It's very easy to reason about the code. It's easier to write tests. It's easier to uh, review other people's diffs. Now, immutable objects are great. Uh, functional programmers love them. Uh, concurrent programmers love them. Now, how do we mutate immutable data? Because we still need to post a comment or a story or like something. Let's take a bird's view of a simplified version of our data model layer. The central piece is graph service. If you want to interact with data graph, you got to talk to graph service. So we have subscriber views that want to do a lookup or a subscribe. They would provide a root object, which can only have ID if you never fetched it before. They would provide properties of interest. Those properties can lead to other nodes from your root object. And they will provide a callback where the result of that operation will be delivered. The result will be MEM model immutable object. Now, when some other view where you have someone tap the like button uh, sends the mutation to graph service, graph service will create a copy of a previous state of the story with only one property change, number of likes. And it will dispatch that same copy to each subscriber whose query matches the story that changed. Having only one copy means that we are not going to waste a lot of memory. Whenever they get a new copy, they will throw away the old one. 
graph service, we take care of forwarding the mutation to server as well and handling potential failures and rollback locally. So what did we do about faulting mechanism? Nothing, because we realized that these queries are finite. People very often query just few levels because you can show only so much on the screen. It's important to require that this query is explicit and is provided. Because if you provide bad defaults, for example, you say, if you don't provide a query, I'll assume that you want to know everything about the object. Then you are promising too much. It can lead to trouble. Someone observes the object, everything about the object, and someone else mark another marks another relationship as something that should be shared. Now suddenly, that everything grows exponentially, and your code runs slower, does more work, and it's not necessary. You just wanted less levels. So we got this new uh, data model architecture, and we wanted to see how to put it in our application. Because remember, we are shipping every two weeks, and we got to change the engine while the airplane is still flying. So we found some well-isolated pieces that are frequently used, because we expected the highest value if you change things there. And we got 35% speed up. That was pretty good. Now we had a different problem. We had application that needs to support two systems, core data and man model. When you had a common code, you needed to code towards some protocols, and then both of these objects would need to conform to that protocol. That grew up our binary size, because now for each data type from our data graph, we got to create a core data object, man model object, and a protocol. It would be really nice if we can get rid of core data completely and get everyone on board with the new architecture. Now, this project was complex enough. It can fill the full talk, but I don't have enough time, so I'm going to tell you about only one aspect that I find particularly interesting. That's incentives. Now, we've got to approach product teams, and we've got to convince them to change the infrastructure. That's not always that easy. Some products are performance sensitive, and if you tell them you're going to run 30% faster, they don't need much to be convinced. They're going to do it. But others are not so performance sensitive. They don't take too much time, and they say, I would rather work on new features. What we did is we prototyped early. All of you probably read the, the Pragmatic Programmer book. You know how good it is to prototype early, and we did it for different purpose. We wanted actually to reassure ourselves that the numbers that we got during profiling are reasonable. But then, when we stripped away all early core data access, we faked some responses, we had something that we could run on two devices and show to product engineers what the world on a new architecture would look like. They were then really motivated to help us, and we ended up finishing this eventually. And this is the result. 25 to 30% reduction of cold start time across all devices. This is huge. Together with other work that we did last year to improve the cold start, we managed to upgrade your phone when it comes to cold start experience. If you had iPhone 4, you are starting Facebook now as if you have iPhone 4S. And a huge part of that effort was new data model layer. Thank you very much. That's all for me. And now I will introduce Daria to you, and she's going to tell you an exciting story about components. Hi, everyone. My name is Daria. I'm an iOS engineer in Facebook London. And today, I will tell you a story that is quite similar to the one that you've just heard from Slobodan, only it happens in the view layer. And it is a story how we uh, changed the view layer implementation of the newsfeed and implemented a new framework based on immutable UI descriptions that we called components. When we first built our app in native, we chose model view controllers architecture for the view layer. Probably most of you know its basic principles. 
model stores data, view displays data, and controller performs all interactions between them. These interactions go in both directions, as changes can come from a model as well as from a view. So let's imagine how newsfeed could look like in this world. Well, there will be a view hierarchy containing the view for entire feed, then subviews for each stories, then a lot of subviews for each story's elements. For example, there will be a view for our much beloved like button. Each of these views will have a corresponding controller, because having just one feed controller with dozens and dozens of thousands lines of code just doesn't seem like a good idea. These controllers will be connected, as they need to set each other up. We're missing one other part of MVC architecture here, don't we? Well, of course, there will also be a data store, and it can be either core data or mem models that will serve data to all com controllers. What happens if you tap a like button? Like button view sends the tap event to its controller, who, in turn, saves the new like status in the data store and sends the tap event up to all other controllers, because they may also want to make some changes, like increase the like count, change scroll position, and save those changes to data store. Of course, all other views can also handle tap event and send them to their controllers. If you summarize all this, you'll get a lot of arrows. And how can it be handled in the multi-threaded environment? Well. Everything can be put in the main UI thread, but it will probably result in just awful performance. OK, separate properties can be made atomic. But if you need to mutate several properties at the same time, it just won't work. OK, let's introduce shared logs in those cases. But it will make logic so complex and so prone to deadlocks. One more trouble we had with our old infrastructure was that we had to manually lay out, write layout code for each view, which means that for a simple story view that would have a header, message, and feedback subviews that need to be stacked vertically and stretched to the full width, we will end up writing something like this. This is a lot of math, and it is spread across two methods, size sizing and actual layout, and, co and logic be, uh, between them can be duplicated. But that's not just it. If the same principle needs to be applied in some other view, this just the same code had to be copied there because it cannot be reused like this. All these troubles that we had resulted in weirdest layout bugs, like Ari has shown, and developing a new feature for Newsfeed was just a nightmare. We could not go on like this anymore. So instead of hacking and tweaking each single problem, we decided to take a step back and look for a solution that will tackle all them at once. We just had implemented mem models with its principle of immutable objects, and it worked great. But actually, MemModels is not the first project inside Facebook based on this principle. Just next door, our JavaScript engineers implemented a framework that had a tremendous success and was based on the very same principles of immutable UI descriptions and also a bunch of other principles that appealed to us a lot. For example, uh, descriptive UI declarative composable UI components, one-way data floor, and so on. So another source of inspiration for us was CSS Flexbox specification that allows you to describe how to position uh, different portions of your UI relative to each other. At that time, React Native, that some of you may have heard of, was only just starting and we needed a solution that could be implemented and integrated in our app as soon as possible. So we took the concepts and principles React is based on and implemented it in Objective-C. And this is how Components Framework was born. It hides 
all direct view manipulation inside the framework. And the actual UI is written using only immutable descriptions. Today, I will mostly focus on the way we took our newsfeed in the Big Blue app and migrated it to components. But before I start, let me just briefly explain what I mean by components infrastructure term that I will be using a lot. When I say that something is done in infrastructure, it means that components framework takes care, uh, takes care of it. So the developers building UI using components don't have to worry about it. Each component is an immutable description of a data model. And infrastructure takes this description and sets up a view for it. And if the model changes, it gets notified by the data store and produces the new component for, for this data model and just replaces the old one with the new one, which means that all data flow goes just in one direction. We implemented many common components describing basic layout principles like staking, indenting, and so on. And all actual layout code for them is hidden in infrastructure. There's no need to repeat all those awful layout math anymore. As components are immutable, we were able to move many computations off main thread into the background, which made the components infrastructure quite performant. Another bonus that it gives is that it reuses and recycles views for uh, UI engineers. There's no need to write special code for that. So how did we move from just general idea what components framework can be to the actual newsfeed implemented on them? Well, obviously, at first we needed to write the infrastructure itself. And it wasn't really a walk in the park. We tried several different approaches, and after some trial and error, the first basic version of the framework was born. But we just tested it on some fabricated data. We wanted to make sure that it will work on the real newsfeed before integrating it in the real app. To do so, we built a simple standalone app that had only one feature. It could render newsfeed containing text-only stories coming from the server using Components Framework. And here you can see a screenshot from that app. It looks pretty simple, but it's still almost like the real newsfeed. So we had our proof of concept. We were ready to move on and to actually integrate the new framework inside the app. We wanted migration process to be as invisible and gradual as possible. To do so, we enabled both frameworks, components and the old infrastructure, to run at the same time. And we added a decider. Each feed story and feed unit coming from the server would go to this decider. And based on story type or some properties, this decider would tell which infrastructure to use to render it. It, uh, it meant that we could migrate different story types at different times. And also, for every new feature that we wanted to build, we could choose whether to build it on only components framework or on both. And so we started once again with the most basic story type, text-only status update. Yeah, it looks simple. But to make it work on components, we had to make sure a lot of basic functionality works. Tap handling, animations, common story components, and so on. Once it was done, we were able to work on other story types in parallel. And so, in no time, we had single photos working on components, then link shares, videos, horizontal scroll units, like people you may know, and so on, and so on, and so on. In order to help us track progress, we had a special debugging tool. With the debugging mode on, 
it would render a special marker on each story rendered using components. And it will also display a counter that will show the current percentage of feed stories converted as you scroll. And as we added more and more story types, this number grew higher and higher and higher, up to the point where we just had a long tail of very rare feed units to deal with. Meanwhile, we also improved the infrastructure itself. We really worked on its performance for it to be almost perfect. Actually, at some point, the only trouble that we had was running both uh, frameworks at the same time. It just consumed a lot of additional memory. So we really pushed to make Components Framework the only one behind the news feed UI. Finally, we had just a few bugs to fix. And some of them were rather tricky, but we did it. Finally, Newsfeed was 100% running on components, and we could just remove all the old code and forget about all the troubles that we had. Before I finish, let me share a few bits of the API and of the way components work under the hood. Components are written in Objective-C++, which is a variation of Objective-C that allows to use C++ structures, vectors, and other code. Here, you can see a simple story component written in Objective-C++. It reads almost like a poem. And this is exactly what we wanted from our framework, to be declarative and very easy to understand from the first glance. C++ structures are using very terse and expressive syntax. And C++ containers are type-safe and nil-safe, so there's no need for additional explicit checks or empty components to omit some parts of the UI. Just to make my point even more clear, let me show you how the same component could have looked like if written in pure Objective-C. We definitely voted for the first one. Cool thing about components is that they don't have to create views. Many of them just describe how to position other, uh, their child components. So it means that if a component tree can be very deep, only the minimal set of views will be created for it. Here, you can see a component tree for a simple story. And yes, we wrote an Xcode debugger helper that will print it. One more debugging tool that we built will force every component to create its view. And this is how view hierarchy would look like with this mode on. It is a lot of views. And if actually all of them had been created, performance would have been awful. But this is how the actual view hierarchy looks like. Yeah, it is more boring to look at, but it is just so much more effective. I have mentioned a few times that components reconfigures and recycle views. What does it mean? If you have ever worked on iOS, you probably know that UI table view reuses itself as you scroll for performance. But engineers using table view are responsible for writing reconfiguration code and to writing it correctly, which is the hardest part. With components, there is no need to worry about it at all. Components infrastructure handles all recycling. The trick is in the way components specify which views to use to, to display them. Each component just says the class of the view that needs to be used and the minimal set of properties that needs to be applied in order for this view to be set up. So when component is ready to be displayed, infrastructure goes into view reuse pool and looks whether there is available view. And if there is, it just takes it out changes the minimal set of properties on it, and the view is ready to be displayed. For example, for a story, such properties can be URL, name, and message. And the story, new story is ready to go. 
Of course, like everything else in this world, components are not perfect. One of the most challenging issues is animation, and it is actually true for any reactive UI framework. It is caused by the very principle all of them are based on, and it is the principle of finite number of states that UI can be in. And animation is dynamic. You need hundreds of states to describe it. Components handle animation in two different ways. For simple ones, for example, like button bouncing. You can just declare the animation that needs to be applied when transitioning from one state to another. For something more complex and fancy, components provide an escape hatch back to the old UI code, and you can write any animations in the old uh, good way, but losing all benefits of declarative UI. One more imperfection that components have right now is lacking the diffing of component tree. So if like button is tapped on a story, components infrastructure will create the whole new tree instead of just replacing like button and like count components. We deliberately chose not to implement it because it uh, meant keeping a lot of additional data in memory and then tweaking performance to make it work good. But for us, Recreating the whole tree was actually quite performant. Despite all the effort it took to build new infrastructure and migrate newsfeed to it, it was totally worth it. Now it takes 70% less code to write newsfeed. Almost all components are in 200 lines of code. Feature development productivity is insanely high. Some of you might have seen similar stories in your feed uh, in the end of last year. This is the new version of Year in Review that we built in London. The whole feature, of course, wasn't trivial, but implementing Newsfeed UI for it took days before it could have taken a month. Feature code is now super easy to read and understand. We don't have those weird layout bugs anymore. As all actual work is done in infrastructure, it is the only place that needs to be optimized. Feature code won't be touched. It means that we have happy engineers, happy managers, and we are one step closer to the ideal world. We put a lot of effort to make components framework work and to be very performant. And we enjoy writing UI using Components Framework so much that we want to share this joy with everyone. And today, we're open sourcing Components Framework. <laughs> so all of you can go to our GitHub repo, download our new framework, integrate it in your app, and enjoy all the benefits that I have just described. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have any more time for questions, but you can find us. We, oh, we do? Sorry. Oh, they reset the timer. OK, we have more time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> as easy as that. Hi. Um, you mentioned C++. It's an immutable model that both of you guys are using. Uh, Apple's just released a new language, Swift, which is all about functional programming. How well do you guys operate in a Swift context? Uh, when we started migrating uh, our app both to MEM models and to components, uh, we started it before the last WWDC, so we needed to work with Objective-C. Now, yes, that Swift is out, we're looking into it and we're thinking how we can apply it, but we probably won't just go and migrate the whole Facebook app only f for Swift right now. Maybe eventually, if it really works out. But I can use Swift to use components in it, right? Uh, probably no, not. not yet. So it's since it's written in C++, which you can't really call from Swift, that's not available. Um, we've started looking at internally what that would look like. That would hopefully be good next steps, but with what we have today, that's not yet possible. You'd have to wrap it in a shim layer. Keep up the good work. Thanks. 
Uh, I noticed uh, that the syntax that you used to compare between uh, the Objective-C++ and Objective-C, the Objective-C++ code actually used uh, the named struct property, which is available in C. So which C++ other C++ uh, features are you using in the components that makes it not feasible to use Objective-C? Well, we also, uh, one more thing that we benefit from in using C++ is that objects there can be stack allocated, so it gives us significant performance boost. But just syn syntax is so much more easier to show that it is so much better. The other trick we're using is uh, initializer lists, so we use standard vectors for like children components, which is a small amount of syntax, but makes it a lot less verbose means you can have nil in the lists and a few other more subtle details. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, is the uh, mem model stuff open source also? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is still a lot of work to do. Uh, Today, they are more coupled with our data model on the server that we would like to, so we cannot commit at the moment. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. You guys started off four or five years ago with the HTML5 version of the app with the phones getting faster and faster and better and better. Do you think there will ever be a day when that decision will be a possibility again to use HTML5 as the app framework? Oh, okay, I'll take that one. Uh, the answer is, it, who knows? Uh, so ultimately what we really enjoy about native that we didn't have as much control over when using web technologies was all of the ability to handle the caching ourselves, all of the lower level interop and rendering, being able to cache you know, rendered text and images and just having really fine tuned control. We worked really hard the, over the last year to get 60 FPS on the iPhone 4 and you know, our, the oldest device we support. And it really took a lot of fine tuning that today, uh, when we look at web technologies internally, we still can't actually achieve. Uh, we continue to look at them. Uh, we have technologies like React that we're pushing really hard for our website and for our mobile browser. And you know, we're pretty excited to see how we can adopt more of that and push forward. Uh, we're constantly looking for what the best abstractions are and you know, just flying as we go. Uh, did you guys roll out these changes gradually over time on the existing code base or kind of separate the team and, and roll out one big time? Uh, yes. For example, for components, as I told, we had a uh, decider. And uh, at first, when we converted the basic stories, uh, our team worked on it. But as we had this long tail, we really asked the actual product teams to convert their product and to parallelize as much as possible. And similar for MEM models, because the project was large, we wanted to identify critical pieces, and we did that ourselves. And then other teams had examples to look at and help with the conversion. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy Thank the rest you of the day. Thank you very much. much.